I'm Phoenix and this is my van. I have spent the past month building a 23 inch high top shell to make it so that I could stand up inside of the van. I have a list of 12 things that I would do differently if I was going to do it again. The first thing that I would do differently is I would start with wood from the beginning. So I went back and forth a lot on whether I wanted it to be a metal shell or a wooden shell or a fiberglass shell. Fiberglass shells from California are very expensive. It's probably completely worth it, but they were overall out of my price range. I considered a lot of different factors when I went into choosing what material I would use. One of those things was what am I familiar with? Initially, I was going to go with metal because I had help. I had somebody that was going to assist me in building a metal shell because I didn't have the experience working with metal, but I did have experience working with wood. So when that person was no longer able to help me with my build, I had to do a pivot and go, uh, go into wood. And considering that I really cared about being able to do this myself and just build this from scratch, insulation was a really important factor for me, wood versus the metal. The wood's a much better insulator. On the other hand, a metal shell has a much better resale value. So my wooden shell does not increase the sellability of my van. In fact, it decreases the sellability of my van. Uh, but that was resale value was not important to me. So going with the wooden shell worked out just fine. The second thing that I would do differently is I would be very careful about where I choose to work. So I didn't have a whole lot of choices, but you know, if I could do it again and had other options available, uh, I got to work with somebody who did the uh, welding for the frame of the shell. And their workspace is this big old shop with a flat floor and concrete floors. And I can imagine that if I had a space like that to work in, that would have made the entire build a lot easier. If I could do it differently, I would find a covered and sealed shop. The third thing I would do differently if I could, and it wasn't realistic for this build, but in the future, I would weld it myself. Um, I haven't welded since I was in high school, and I, I really enjoyed welding when I did it in high school, but I wasn't trusting of myself enough to pursue welding it myself. Plus I didn't have the tools. I would try to figure out, uh, you know, what are those tools? How much do they cost? And could I just do it myself instead of having somebody else do that for me? The person that did it for me did an amazing job and I'm incredibly grateful, but it would have been really cool to do that part myself. Another thing I'd need to do differently, if it's kind of uh, two different parts of the structure of the shell. I would make it about an inch and a half less wide than it is. The width that I made it it sits almost exactly in the gutters of the van on either side, um, the metal frame, the steel frame. What that means is when I bolted it down, I was bolting very near or into the gutter itself, which is a major potential leak point. If I were to do it differently, I'd have make, made it about an inch and a half narrower so that the uh, steel frame was sitting on top of the van instead of in the gutters especially in the long term, I, I foresee there being potential leaks uh, because of that structural flaw. The second part of that is making the incline. So currently the front part of the shell is three inches taller than the back part of the shell. And I did that so that water could roll off um, so it didn't pool and settle on top of the van. Uh, it's working okay. I mean, I had snow up there and it melted off just fine, but I have noticed very small puddles. They seem to come off when I drive, but very small puddles still pool. So I think a four inch in, like decline would have made a difference in improving that, uh, that flow of water off of the top of the van. The sixth thing that I would change or do differently is I would use adhesive instead of nails. So before you critique me on it, I, I used underlayment, which is something you use on rooftops underneath the shingles to direct water and waterproof over the plywood. I figured if it works on a rooftop, it probably would work on a van too, to prevent water from getting to the plywood layer. 
but the only way that underlayment is attached that I could find online is with plastic capped nails. And nails are problematic for a van build for a number of reasons. One of them is the vibration. Over time, that vibration will likely vibrate out those nails. They're not built for something that is in motion. And number two, it's another potential leak point. I'm assuming since it works on a rooftop that it has, because they're plastic capped or something, it has a method for preventing water from getting in. But it still worries me if there's like a tear in the underlayment or anything like that, that that can become a leak in a couple years. And that's, that's not a good thought. If I were to do this again, I would research pretty heavily some adhesives and see if I could find a good adhesive to use to put down the underlayment. But I'd have to research how that adhesive interacts with the material of the underlayment itself, make sure it doesn't weaken it or degrade it. I would find an adhesive to use instead of the plastic cap nails because I'm worried that down the road those will be problematic. The seventh thing that I would do differently is I would put down all the layers of the roofing before I do the skylights. The order in which I did this was I installed the plywood and then um, I cut holes in the plywood for the skylights and the vents and then I installed the skylights and then I did the layers such as the underlayment and the rubber roofing. If I were to do it differently I would do the underlayment and the rubber roofing first and then I would install the skylights. My thought process was is I wanted that seal to be directly on the plywood. I didn't want there to be any layers underneath it that water could leak in underneath the skylight but ultimately cutting around those circles with like a piece of rubber and stuff was incredibly difficult and it ended up with like little gaps around it and everything and it just it was not as clean as I would like it to be. The eighth thing that I would do differently is I would use slightly thinner plywood. I went with a pretty hefty plywood and the weight is really important. Ultimately, this didn't end up being too very heavy. Feel free to guess the weight if you like. I'm going to have a separate video that talks about the weight. I would have used a slightly thinner plywood than I did. I like this thickness that I used. The reason why I went with the thickness that I used, like not half an inch, a little bit less than that. But the reason why I went with that was because I knew I would be doing the cedar siding and I knew I would need this something to screw into to give that cedar side siding stability. So a thicker plywood to me was going to be more structurally sound. I think I was right in that regard. On the other hand, that's an it. That's kind of an iffy one. Considering the ending weight, I'm pretty happy with uh, the fact that I can jump on the roof and not worry about it cracking or breaking and that the, uh, the screws had a plenty to bite into to screw in the cedar siding. The ninth thing I would do differently is I would get a bigger piece of roofing rubber. I believe I got a piece that was 10 by 10 and unfortunately that meant that I have a seam. Um, right on top of the roof there is a piece of, I ended up using some rubber gorilla tape. Uh, it's like six inches wide, it's ex extremely sticky, and it's got a rubber coating on top. And that's what I used along with some butyl tape I used to seal the seam that I ended up having. Because I put rubber roofing on the, the incline of the shell, the rubber roofing needed to be longer than the top. So I was thinking, oh, it's 10 feet long, that'll be fine. But it, that only covered the very top of it. It didn't count the front. Just a, a weakness down the road. Um, you know, as that tape deteriorates, I'm gonna have to keep an eye, make sure that stays in good shape. Make sure you do your measurements well and order a piece of rubber that is plenty long enough to just have it be one solid sheet. And if you have extra, you can put it on the sides, which, you know, there's no losing with that. You're just adding more layers of uh, water resistance. The 10th thing that I would do differently is I would figure out how to stretch or to very securely flatten the roofing rubber. The way I have it now, it's kind of loose and you know, I was doing this all by myself, so it's possible I really couldn't have done much better, but I feel like it could have been much flatter and much um, maybe stretched a little bit so that 
it's tight on the surface. Right now there are slight bubbles. There's kind of bubbles and waves in the rubber and that causes water to pool a little bit. I didn't know how to properly install roofing rubber when I went into this and I unfortunately did that research a little bit too late and most of the time it's installed with an adhesive. But something I had to consider was the rub roofing rubber went right on top of the underlayment. So whatever adheres to the roofing rubber to bind it to the roof has to bind, had to bind it to the underlayment, which isn't, it's not a surface that's very friendly to adhesives. The 11th thing that I would do differently would be getting more trim. When I got my trim boards from the Home Depot, there was only a couple choices that were long enough to work for the top piece that was the longest piece. I estimated out, and I was just eyeballing it, but I estimated out at how many pieces of trim I would need to do the whole shell, and I was wrong. I, I needed quite a bit more than that, so I've got a little bit of mismatch because instead of going the two hours it takes for me to get to Home Depot, I instead just went to the local feed and seed and got some pine and finished it with that. So there's a little bit of mismatch in my trim and uh, it resulted in a few pieces that are a little bit short and they don't quite meet correctly so it, it looks rough. Functionally doesn't really affect anything. The final thing that I would have done differently, I would work in the spring or the summer because working in the winter is so difficult. It is so cold, so it, you're miserable for one. But on the other hand, when you're doing things like staining wood, uh, I just painted the roof with, uh, with white rubber paint to reflect sunlight. Or when you're caulking things, the cold weather really gets in the way. It affects how quickly things dry. It affects how well they work. And it really slows down the workflow, not just in you being cold and moving slow, but just so many things take longer in the cold. But I want to get on the road, and so I got to work in the winter. Uh, and that's something that also could have been solved by being able to work indoors if I had a shop of some kind that had, you know, a heated environment. Uh, that would make a huge difference uh, and, wouldn't, and it kind of takes the place of, of it being spring. But working outside, definitely if you are able to wait until spring or summer to do your work, do that. It makes a big difference. Those are all 12 things I would do differently. I'm really happy, really very happy with how my shell turned out. And I, uh, you know, if I do it again in the future, those are, those are the changes I'd make. So I hope that's helpful.